Hello and welcome to the Open Charge Alliance webinar. Uh, this is uh, the second session of our V2X um, task group uh, webinar and we will be presenting uh, some experts from the fields by BMW, Dreef and Coastal. And uh, we have a very full schedule. We have 45 minutes and we will start off with Frank Buffe of the Open Charge Alliance. Are you ready, Frank? Yes, I am. If you make me yes, present, there you I are. Now. Yeah, you can share your screen. For all attendees, uh, please, uh, if you have any questions during the presentations, uh, ask them in the questions box and we will uh, answer them after the session and we'll try to answer as much as possible. Uh, but first off, we have Frank, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, everybody, welcome to this webinar about uh, letting your car provide the power. Uh, let's see if I can get my presentation back, yep. So uh, within the Open Charge Alliance, we uh, started a vehicle to x task group in uh, 2019. And our goal was to extend the uh, OSPP2 release with support for vehicle to grid without breaking any of the existing smart charging functions. And uh, what we are aiming to do with these extensions is to support all new features of the ISO 1511-8-20 standard, the new upcoming standard. And at the same time, we remain compatible with uh, Salomo, so you can use it with <coughs> both standards. So uh, when creating these extensions, we started out with a number of use cases that, uh, yeah, some of them, our members in the, in the task group were planning to to implement. There are these uh, five cases, and I will just quickly explain to you what they look like. So the uh, uh, central set point uh, case is probably the most uh, straightforward. Uh, central set point is the situation where the CSMS, the backend, uh, sends a set point to the charger, and at that set point, at that value, the EV should either charge or or discharge, and it can also provide a, a bandwidth uh, for that. And the external set point use case is a case where we have an energy management that can provide the set point. So in that case, the backend tells the charger, you're going to get this set point from the energy management uh, system. Uh, another use case is uh, frequency control. Uh, frequency control is about uh, maintaining a stable grid frequency. Uh, so is the uh, too much energy is consumed on the on the grid, then the net frequency may drop, and this can be compensated by delivering energy back to the grid. So, uh, in the case of local frequency control, uh, the CSMS submits a charging profile with a power frequency table. Uh, you see an example uh, here in, in in the picture, uh, where you see that if the uh, frequency drops, for example, you request the EV to discharge more or or less and this is something that the charging station can do itself locally if the charging station is equipped with a, a frequency meter so it can uh, then dynamically adjust the set point to the EV. If the charging station does not have its own frequency meter then the CSMS can provide this information and then we call it central frequency control and then the CSMS provides these uh, that information to the to the charging station, and uh, yeah, our speaker from uh, Dreef will tell more about uh, how they implemented this in a yeah commercial uh, scenario. Uh, local load balancing that deals with the situation where you use the EV, yeah, to limit the amount of power that is uh, drawn from a grid connection. So in local load balancing, we request the CSMS to set an upper and a lower uh, threshold. And then the charging station will make sure that the set point uh, is set in such a way so that it compensates the, the measured load and it stays within these uh, thresholds. So the result is then that you 
uh, get a usage that is yeah, exactly within these uh, thresholds. This is something that uh, our speakers from BMW and Costa will uh, uh, speak about. Now the uh, current state uh, within the uh, uh, V2X task group is that uh, we now have a preliminary specification that can be used by uh, task group members. It has a description of the use cases, the messages, the data types, and the JSON uh, schemas. And uh, yeah, because at Open Charge Alliance, we we value that there have been pilot implementations of a specification before we really uh, publish it. Uh, we found uh, BMW and Costal and Dreef, uh, yeah, as, as partners that are you know, really implementing these uh, these schemas. And we have got a lot of feedback already uh, over the last year uh, while doing this. So with that feedback, we keep improving the uh, specification. So uh, we're not completely done yet with the, use with, uh, with the task group because we are still investigating now new use cases to help for injecting reactive power, for example, uh, with uh, probably something like a, a quality voltage uh, graph or something. And we're also investigating whether we need some additional uh, yeah, functionality for vehicle to home or vehicle to building for as far as that is not managed by the local load balancing because local load balancing if you set the thresholds to zero for example then you can also do a strict vehicle to home scenario so our uh, planning is that uh, by the end of this year we want to release a white paper uh, that describes how you can implement all the messages that we've made now as custom data extensions on release 201 because everything that we add now is just extensions to what we have on 201 so you can use that as custom data extensions and then uh, yeah in uh, OSPP 2.x uh, probably the next OSPP 2 release we then plan to release figure to grid as an integral part of this release so Thanks for uh, listening, and then I give the floor back to uh, Martijn. Yes, thank you, Frank. We will start off with the participants of the technical of, of the work task force, task group. Sorry. Um, first off, uh, we have Dreef, and I will ask Paul Kodani. Yes, Paul, you're ready. I will make you a presenter so you can share your screen. Yes, I see the PowerPoint, not the presentation yet. Yes, here we have a presentation. Okay, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh... Hello everyone, my name is uh, Paul Kodani. I'm project manager at DRIV. The, ob the objective of this presentation is to explain you uh, quickly how at DRIV we are already relying on CPP to provide commercial V2X services. So first, um, in a nutshell, who we are, um, so DRIV is a so-called uh, electric vehicle aggregator. So what we do is that basically we are controlling the charging and discharging process of a fleet of distributed electric vehicles. Um, and we are doing so in order to uh, value the, this flexibility uh, on the energy markets uh, to get some revenues by means of this flexibility and ultimately to reduce the total cost of ownership of electric vehicles for our customers. Of course, we do so while always making sure that EV driver mobility needs are uh, always met as they are uh, the priority over the uh, B2X services. Um, and uh, just for the notice, uh, DRIV is a joint venture between EDF, which is one of the main electricity supplier and producer in Europe, and Newbie, a US-based startup company which was founded in 2008 to work uh, and which is uh, um, 
specialist in uh, B2G solutions. So where is driven the complicated e-mobility value chain? Uh, we are a technological partner for CPOs, uh, e-mobility service providers, uh, car manufacturing, car manufacturers, and our objective is to provide turnkey smart charging and B2G solutions. So we're not a customer-facing entity, and our goal is uh, to work on one side with customer-facing entities such as CPOs, uh, EMSPs, utilities. Uh, on the other side, with uh, market actors such as large-scale aggregators. And, and of course, uh, we need to consider um, uh, the interface with uh, car OEMs uh, for the, the development of uh, robust B2G solutions. So, to give uh, you just a little bit of background about what we did, uh, and, and that will be helpful to understand uh, why we, we did this test with the OCPP. So from mid-2019 to mid-2020, uh, we launched uh, on-the-field proof of concept, uh, during which we deployed around 50 V2G charging stations on the field at customer facilities um, in order to learn from the field uh, about uh, technical uh, and uh, customer-oriented topics. And uh, during this proof of concept, the charging stations were operated by means of a proprietary protocol, communication protocol. Um, so uh, by, by the end of this proof of concept, at the end, our target was then to try to um, go one step forward in the deployment of B2G services. And therefore, we launched a new commercial offer uh, in, for, in December 2020. Uh, together with a new V2G charging station, uh, which you will see on the next slide. And as our objective is to ramp up on the production um, and, to, um, and, and to deploy an industrial solution to ramp up, of course, we wanted to rely on uh, as much as possible on standardized communication protocol. And that's why we decided to rely on OCPP to provide our B2X services. And our ambition with this new offer is to roll out uh, around 1,000 charging stations within the next two years. Uh, so you can see on the picture on, on the right, the, um, the official, uh, which is extract, an extract from the official website of uh, Easyvia, our uh, CPO partner in France, uh, which is the commercial co commercial entity for this offer. Um, and so the main news drive between use cases that we are uh, providing with this commercial offer are the following. So frequency regulation services to the transmission system operator. And of course, um, because you always, always need sometimes to send some specific set points, we need to be able to uh, send charging, discharging, set point profile, to the charging stations. So just in a nutshell, uh, this is the charging station that we're using for our new commercial offer. It's an uh, industrial B2G charging station which was designed by ABB uh, considering uh, the DRIV and more largely speaking group EDF requirements uh, in order to uh, include from the beginning the most recent and stringent requirements from the energy market perspective and in particular from the TSO perspective in terms of reaction time, accuracy and so on to be sure that we would be able to provide the relevant B2X use cases with this charging station. So the main characteristics are the following. It's a 11 kilowatt DC three-phase chat demo at the moment charging station. Uh, it has the capability to measure locally the grid frequency to provide local grid frequency uh, service. And uh, it is, uh, from the historical perspective, compliant with OCPP 1.6. So ABB had uh, 
already developed uh, OCPP 1.6 stack uh, for their for their other charging station. Uh, of course, this product will uh, evolve in the future. We expect a CCS version in particular as soon as uh, CCS will be V2G compliant. Um, and as explained, uh, we have already deployed uh, these uh, stations from December 2020. So, as explained, we want to rely on a CPP to provide V2X services. Um, and at the same time, in order to go fast, uh, we need also to rely on the existing solutions on the ABB side, which is OCPP 1.6. So how did we do that? Basically, we rely on OCPP 1.6 for all the uh, legacy and typical uh, operational messages for the operation of the charging station. And then we encapsulated uh, the messages from the OCPP V2X extension into the data transfer messages of the OCPP 1.6 protocol. So, so that um, the OCPP stack did not have to be changed on the charging station side. Uh, and we were able already to send and to send to the charging station and receive from the charging station specific V2X messages. And to be and, and ultimately uh, be able to provide V2X services on the field. So uh, th that enabled us to to conduct a lot of testing during the product development phase. Uh, of course, the primary interest for us was to, to test the, the ABB product and our services, but it was also a good opportunity to test the OCPP V2X uh, extension. So, according to what I explained before and uh, according to our main V2X use cases, the OCPP V2X use cases which we tested are the following ones. Central V2X control profile in order, as I explained, to send charging and discharging profiles to the charging station. Um, local V2X control for frequency support. Uh, so, these are our two main functional use cases, I would say, and then we had to test uh, the edge use cases, which are non-functional use cases, including um, minimizing energy consumption and going offline and resuming a V2X operation after an offline period. So you can see a picture on the top right of a, a ABB prototype under test with a Nissan vehicle. And for example, at, at the bottom, a frequency uh, response test with a frequency step where we, uh, we crossed a frequency step and we uh, saw that the uh, charging station was uh, power response was following the frequency deviations. So by conducting all these tests, we were able to provide some feedback to the OCA to improve the, the V2X extension, or I would say to complete maybe the V2X extension. So just quickly speaking, what we proposed is um, main modifications that we proposed is some uh, modifications uh, for specifically for the certification uh, processes that uh, you need to take and you need to pass your fleet if you want to provide uh, FCR frequency regulation services with the TSO. Um, the instant charge function, which enables the customer to request either remotely with a mobile application or locally with the charging station HMI, uh, an instant charge with the charging station, meaning that the customer wants to opt out of the V2X service and he or she wants uh, her car or his car to charge at the maximum power available right now. And some, uh, some, thing, some feedback about the, the management of offline behavior. And so once again, just to, 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 to highlight the, the, the test that we did, you can see, um, so it's quite small, but you can see on, on the bottom um, car, uh, car and ABB V2G charging station providing uh, frequency regulation and the, the middle green curve is the power exchange on the AC interface of the charging station. And you can see that it's fluctuating on a permanent basis as it follows 
the frequency deviations. So after the lab test that we did, of course, we moved on to the deployment phase and we are now um, uh, increasingly deploying more and more uh, ADB uh, V2X charging station on the field. And these stations are located at customer facilities and they are operated by means of OCPP. So as I explained, OCPP 1.6 plus V2X messages encapsulated in data transfer messages. So as a conclusion, I think the, the, the main uh, message that we wanted to provide with this presentation is that uh, sometimes V2X uh, uh, looks like um, uh, something that is quite futuristic and that is not uh, available right now. Um, well, it, it, of course, it's still uh, an innovation, but it's already possible to provide V2X services with industrial products and relying on standardized communication protocols. And the OCPP V2X uh, extension is already quite mature, although there are still some discussions uh, and, and uh, some people are still providing feedback to the group and we are considering new use cases as Frank uh, introduced them, but still it's already quite mature. It's already enabled to provide services, V2X services. And for, uh, I think, for stakeholders like DRIV, smart charging operators, but more generally speaking, for the whole uh, electromobility ecosystem, I think the publication of uh, the white paper that Frank mentioned and the future OCPP 2.x protocol, including V2x functionalities, will represent major milestones uh, for, for these uh, stakeholders. So thank you for listening and don't hesitate to ask uh, questions. Yes, thank you, Paul, for your presentation. And I would remind everyone, because I've seen uh, a lot of attendees uh, arriving a little bit late, uh, you can still ask uh, questions, uh, use the questions box uh, during the presentation. And after the presentations, we will uh, check if we can uh, answer them. Uh, let's see, next up is uh, Julian Centoir. Oh, one moment. Next up is Julian uh, Centoir of uh, BMW. Are you present yet? Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes. I hear you and I will make you a presenter. Yes, we have a PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, we will activate the full screen. Yes, it works. Okay, good okay. luck. Thank you. Uh, so, my uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Julien Santoir. Uh, I work in the technical development uh, for bidirectional charging. Um, and I would like to, to present you how we implement the OCPP communication with the V2X extension that we uh, developed in the task group in, in our, our pilot project, uh, Bidirectional Charging Management. Uh, that is an R&D project that, uh, that is conducted uh, by German companies from the automotive and the energy sector, as you can see on the bottom uh, right uh, of the slide. Uh, and it is also um, supported by different research institutes. Um, so the shared vision of the project is to, uh, is to use the energy storage capacity of electric vehicles uh, that is not used for the mobility um, to do different energy services that could help the energy transition and make electric vehicles more attractive uh, by reducing uh, the energy cost or by generating uh, additional revenues. We will test uh, 50 bidirectional vehicles with wallbox uh, by private households and by fleet owners. 
uh, and we will test three different V2X use cases. The first is the increase of solar self-consumption. It's a vehicle to home use case. Um, the idea here is uh, that when the photovoltaic system of a house more power produce than currently needed for the house, uh, this surplus of energy will be stored in the vehicle and if it is not all needed for the mobility, uh, it could be reused later uh, to supply the house consumers, typically in the, in the evening. The second use case is the intraday trading. It's a vehicle to grid use case. Uh, in this use case, uh, we will aggregate vehicles to pools to reach a certain amount of power and energy to have access to, to the electricity market. Uh, and we will uh, charge the electric vehicles when the price at the electricity market is low and eventually discharge the vehicles uh, when the price is high. The third use case is peak shaving. It's a vehicle to business use case. Uh, the idea here is uh, to reduce the peak, the electricity peak consumption uh, at the grid connection point of companies uh, by discharging the vehicles at the right moment uh, so that the, the company could reduce the charges they pay for the electricity infrastructure. Um, in this slide, you see uh, the system architecture uh, we use to realize this use case. So it's a simplified architecture uh, for the private uh, household. So we, we have, a, of course, a bi-directional electric vehicle, a bi-directional wall box, uh, coastal wall box with DC power transfer. Uh, it could charge and discharge at 11 kilowatts. It communicates with the vehicle uh, with uh, ISO 15118-20 uh, draft version. It communicates uh, through the OCPP communication with the VTWIC functionalities with a backend or CSMS that we, de that we, that we developed at BMW. Uh, this, uh, this backend has two main roles. Uh, one is uh, to compute and uh, to compute uh, charging profiles and communicate with, uh, with the wall box. Uh, and the other is uh, to aggregate vehicle to pools to, uh, to exchange them with the electricity market. Uh, this backend communicate also with the vehicles through telematics and with a mobile app that we developed, especially for the project, to give uh, the users the possibility to enter their charging uh, on their mobility needs. Uh, and also to give the, the users uh, uh, live information. On the AC side of the wall box, uh, it is uh, connected for private households uh, to PV system, to household consumers, to a smart meter at the grid connection point. Uh, there is also a smart meter gateway and optionally a home energy management system that uh, communicate uh, with the AA bus communication. So in this part, I will show you uh, what are the main activities uh, of our backend through the CPP communication with the V2X. Uh, so at, uh, at the start of transaction, when the vehicle is plugged at the wall box, um, the, the backend will collect different data uh, so from the wall box, he will uh, receive charging information. He will receive uh, the identification of the vehicle, of the wall box, um, the energy request and power limits that are coming from the ISO 15118 communication, and uh, eventually the request of the users for instant charging. So instant charging is a is a function that uh, allow uh, the user to have this car uh, charge as quickly as possible and de uh, deactivate the V2X uh, operation. Uh, this function could be, uh, can be activated at the wall box or in the mobile app. 
uh, and from the mobile apps, the backend will collect also uh, the mobility need of the users through the target SOC and the departure time. So with all this charging information, uh, the backend will be able to compute a V2X charging profile and send them uh, to the to the wall box. Depending uh, of the, the use case we would like to realize, there is different V2X operation mode uh, for the vehicle to grid and vehicle to business use case. We use a central set point here, as already presented by Frank. In this in this mode, um, we can send a power set point that will be followed by the wall box. And uh, for the vehicle to home use case, uh, we use a local load balancing mode and that will trigger local control uh, based on uh, value from the smart meter. An interesting function is that we could uh, send the, the V2X profile as the X default profile. Uh, so that we don't need systematically to send a new profile to the wall box if it is uh, always the same. That is uh, the case for the vehicle to home use case. Yeah. Um, during the DC power transfer, uh, the wall box will send uh, meter values and data from monitoring to the back end regularly. Uh, and these data are used uh, eventually to update the profile, uh, to control the pool of vehicles uh, for the vehicle to grid and vehicle to business, to give here uh, some charging information to the mobile app, uh, eventually to support in case of failure. And uh, as we do a research project, uh, uh, also for analytic purposes. And last but not least, uh, the wall box has the possibility um, to be configured through the back end. Uh, and uh, here for the vehicle to home use case in the local load balancing mode, the back end could uh, configure the, the power threshold at the grid connection point from which the wall box will start to charge and discharge the vehicle and some other proprietary variables, uh, for example, for the pause mechanism uh, that will allow the vehicle to sleep if no activity is needed. Uh, so to conclude, and as, uh, as you can see, uh, we can uh, send all the data we need for the V2X use case through the OCPP communication with the V2X extension. So for us, it's a key communication standard for bidirectional charging. Um, uh, and um, nevertheless, it, it, could be, uh, it, it could be perfect uh, to accelerate the time to market so that it is synchronized with other communication standards uh, and especially the ISO 15 11.8-20 that will come uh, this year. So I'm finished with my presentation. I thank you all for your attention and I thank you also the, the OCA for the good cooperation uh, on the V2X topic. And thank you very much, Julian. Let's see, we will proceed with David Reyes of Coastal. Are you present, David? Yeah, hello. There you are. Let's see, I'll make you a presenter so you can share your screen. Okay, do you see my screen? Here we go. I see your screen in presentation mode. Yes, the floor is yours. Yeah, hello, my name is uh, David Reyes. I'm from Costa Industria Electric GmbH. And uh, yeah, first a few facts about the Costa company. Um, Costa was founded in Lüdenscheid in uh, 1912. And it's grown over the years, and today it's active in 20 countries with 46 locations. And today there are four business division: um, automotive, electric, automotive, electric, 
connectors, industrial electronics, and SOMA. Um, yeah, today I'm talking about the uh, local load balancing mode uh, with a bidirectional DC wall box from Costal. Uh, first, I will give a brief overview of the components involved in the local load balancing. Um, then I'll explain the limitations related to the SOC of the battery. Next, I talk about the communication protocols involved in local load balancing. And in the last step, I talk about a few technical details. In the overall system, the wall box uh, forms a connection between the vehicle and the house. And among other things, it regulates the use of uh, solar energy for charging the vehicle in the local load balancing mode. And uh, in the local load balancing uh, scenario, the vehicle battery is divided into three areas, A, B, and C. And these areas are limited by minimum SOC and target uh, SOC. And uh, within area A, uh, charging takes place as maximum power. And area B disables the, uh, the discharging of the vehicle. And uh, in area C, the vehicle can also be discharged. Um, there are four main components to activate and control the local load balancing mode. Uh, the communication with the backend is uh, established via OCPP. And the power at the uh, house grid connection is transmitted from uh, Costal Smart Meter Energy, uh, smart, uh, Costal Smart Energy Meter via Modbus TCP. And uh, ISO 1511-8-20 is uh, used to communicate with the vehicle. And the dynamic mode uh, of ISO 1511-8-20 is used. And the process of the local load balancing mode, um, the excess or required power is measured periodically at the house connection point and the wall box uh, calculates a new set point uh, from the uh, from the values and charts the vehicle accordingly. And uh, in this scenario, the vehicle only communicates its limits. Um, I will now explain the different operation points uh, with the help of a diagram. First, a simple case, uh, surplus power is loaded in the vehicle. Uh, but the surplus power can only be used within uh, predefined limits. And the limitations can come from the vehicle uh, via OCPP and from the wallbox itself. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and the, the, the uh, wallbox and the vehicle uh, have uh, self consumption. And at lower charging power, it's inefficient to charge. So in order to waste as little energy as uh, possible, the energy flow is paused below a minimum power level. And uh, as soon uh, the charge level is above the target SOC, the same behavior applies uh, to discharging. And if the solar uh, system supplies less energy than required, uh, this supplemented from the vehicle. Um, for longer periods, uh, with low set points, the uh, high level communication uh, with the vehicle is stopped and uh, the charging electronics and the vehicle go uh, into a sleep mode. And if enough power is requested over a long longer period of time, uh, the charging electronics and the vehicle are woken up and the communication is uh, restarted. Well, thank you for your attention. Uh, any questions, please ask. 
Yes, thank you, David. Um, let's see, yes, we have a room for a couple of questions, about 10 minutes, so I think we will manage. Um, I want to ask uh, Julian and uh, David uh, and uh, Frank uh, to turn on the cameras. Yes, Paul, of course. Let's see, we have a lot of questions, some are very technical, so we hope we can uh, answer them in the, in, the, in the email. But let's see, first off, let's see, at how many charging stations will V2G services start to become commercially uh, viable? Like saying, uh, one, users won't notice much, and two, the benefits will match the cost of building this. Who can answer a question like this? Well, I think Paul, because they are implementing a commercial solution for this. <laughs> Um, that's a very tough question. I don't know if I can answer it. I, I'd be happy to be able to answer it. Um, I think it, it's, it's, to be honest, I, I won't be able to answer precisely this question. It really depends on the services that you're providing, on your business case. So, as you could see, um, on Drift side, our use case is to provide frequency regulation services. Uh, but we, what we've seen uh, in the presentations from Julien and David is, is that it's also possible to target other use cases, and so the economics will be different. Um, so it would also depend on the country mm -hmm. where you're doing services. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, um, it's really difficult to to answer this question. <laughs> okay, well we have a couple of more, so. For the next one, uh, let's see uh, what V2X use cases are interesting for the end user. So what's in it for the EV driver? Maybe Frank, Frank, can you answer that? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think that's, uh, for example, in uh, the use case that uh, Julian showed, we have a vehicle to home situation where you have your uh, local uh, solar panels delivering energy and when you're not using that energy it could be used for example to charge the car and then uh, later at night when there's no sun you can take the energy from your car for, again into your home for example that might be a, a, a use case or uh, yeah maybe Julia, you have other examples you mentioned something like intraday trading also but i think it's maybe more for the future i don't know yeah, I think uh, all V2X use cases uh, have um, an advantage for the for the end user. It could be direct or in indirect. So of course, a vehicle to home use case uh, to store uh, electricity from uh, from your solar installation. It's a, um, a direct advantage for the for the for the customer. But also, for example, uh, for vehicle to grid use case uh, and uh, intraday intraday handle, intraday trading, uh, then it it will uh, uh, generate additional revenues, or uh, you can um, charge your car at reduced cost, and then uh, then the the customer will have we can save money, so it will also be interesting. And for vehicle to business, I'll speak sharing it. Uh, so the, the customer is here, not a private household, but a company, but the, the company will also reduce uh, the, the charge for the electricity infrastructure. So it will also be a, a, an advantage for the, for the users. Yeah. yeah. Just to complement, I, I definitely agree with, with what has been, been said. I think there are basically three main. So customer uh, uh, adoption is, is crucial for, for the deployment of B2X. I think there are three uh, main advantages for B2X users or B2X customers. It can be either from the environmental perspective to uh, 
show that basically you're going green. It can be to save money and it can be uh, to demonstrate that you have innovative approaches uh, um, as a company or as an individual. And of course, when we think about B2G, we, we think that the, the long-term target should be that all uh, B2X customers will be uh, uh, will join the B2X uh, adventure because they will save money at some point. And I think we are all targeting that and, and B2X would not make sense in the long term if we're not able to, if B2X customers are not able to benefit uh, from the economical perspective from B2X. Then as of today, and I think this comes back to the first question which was raised, I think uh, the economics are uh, not yet, I would say, completely mature yet. And so it's true to say that a lot of the customers who opt in for B2X services are also interested in the image that they will provide with such services, uh, either an innovation image or um, uh, an environmentally friendly image. And, and these, uh, these uh, image factors are from what we see, from our perspective, very important to, to get the customer commitment to, to, to these services. Okay, thank you. Very elaborate and very clear, I think. Let's see, we have another question specifically for Paul, but maybe others want to join. Um, how do you monitor the over... Uh, oh, no, it's... It disappeared. No, it's clear. Um, let's see. How do you monitor the over solicitation of the battery in the case of automation of frequency regulation directly at EVSE level? So I, I assume this question is related to the battery degradation topic and how we 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 so so. so um, uh, so of, of course, first we have a real time monitoring of that's happening on, on our charging station and we also need to have this real-time monitoring for a service monitoring perspective. Then I think for the, uh, more generally, for the battery degradation topic. Um, so it's a very complicated topic which has, which has been much addressed in a lot of scientific publications and so on. Uh, ourselves, we are conducting a lot of research on this topic. Uh, um, also supported by the uh, R&D of the EDF group. But I, I would say from a smart charging operator, in the end, uh, what is important is that the, the, the customer will not be afraid of the impact on the battery. And the best way to have the customer not afraid about that is to have the car manufacturer um, uh, let the customer know that uh, his battery, warrant, battery warranty will be maintained even if we provide V2X services. And so, apart from all the research that we can conduct, all uh, trying to identify the factors that uh, have some impact on, can, uh, on battery aging and so on, I think what is really crucial is to have good uh, collaboration and partnership between smart charging operators and car manufacturing companies and for instance, that's what we have today as Drive with Nissan. Uh, to, we, we, so um, we have worked uh, ahead of the, in the development phase with Nissan. Uh, we have validated uh, some uh, V2X profiles. We have uh, evaluated, anticipated the potential impact on the, on the battery together with Nissan. And as of today, when we uh, provide V2X services with uh, a car, uh, a Nissan vehicle, Nissan um, maintains the warranty for the customers. And that comes back to, to, to what the customers need to hear to to confident that uh, they will not uh, suffer from any impact uh, due to uh, the provision of B2X services. And maybe I can uh, add two points on a technical uh, point of view. Um, the, the first one is that the use case we, uh, we test here for bidirectional charging uh, are at uh, low power. Huh? It's uh, 
So in our case, it's between zero and maximum 11 kilowatts. So it's uh, not so critical uh, for the battery. And the other point is that we, we see there is a trend uh, on the market with even bigger batteries. Uh, so if we if you have bigger batteries, uh, then uh, during the, the lifetime, the, the battery could do uh, also more energy transfer. Uh, and then you have more potential for uh, for energy transfer in addition to the mobility. Uh, uh, exactly, yeah. Thank you. I'm looking at the clock and unfortunately we have to uh, come to a close of this. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, Julian, David and Frank, of course, for your uh, presentations and uh, the answers you gave uh, to our questions. As said, there are many more questions, but we will try to resolve them uh, through email. Uh, thank you to all the attendees. Um, we are very delighted that this is a topic that uh, lives uh, with uh, so many of you. Um, let's see, I want to share one screen by myself. This one. I hope it's visible because, uh, of course, we want you uh, to uh, join the Open Charge Alliance if uh, this topic interests you. But also just visit our website, uh, openchargealliance.org. Uh, there you can find the white papers as mentioned in this webinar. And you will also find uh, links to our several videos on YouTube of our webinars. Uh, today we have one more webinar to go. That will be the CTEP regulations in California with uh, Frank Buver. He will be joining me at six o'clock here in Europe. And it's about in a couple of minutes. Uh, so for now, thank you very much, and I want to wish you a very happy day. And that's it. I will be closing this in a moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.